Hi everybody. So we're looking at why mass immigration is the number one factor in Ireland's healthcare crisis. Now, before I get into the material itself, I want to establish a few um, basic premises for, for this argument. I won't be arguing that immigration restriction would, in and of itself, solve Ireland's healthcare crisis. Just that it's a first step and an essential precondition to any positive change. Um, I want to debunk the commonly held belief that mass immigration actually sustains our health service. I think the evidence suggests it's it's quite contrary to that. Uh, so basically, this will be two pronged. Um, firstly, we're talking about the the population pressure put on the system in the first place, um, and that being a core to the problem uh, we have. So I, that's quite easily evidenced and uh, quite straightforward. And then secondly, which is a bit more nuanced, is that I contend that mass immigration from developing countries offers a pressure valve to poor management and has a stagnating um, effect on pay and working conditions. Uh, it also adds to the high turnover rate of staff in Irish hospitals which adds to uh, this chaotic and demoralizing environment for staff and from a human resources perspective, which is, you know, at the heart of this, uh, the problem here, um, among other things. So let's just get into the business end of it now anyway. So just the, the information itself. Um, so 1 million, the number of extra people, the Irish Health Service will have to deal with by 2030, with the major driver being inward migration according to the ESRA report, Projections of Demand for Healthcare in Ireland, 2015 to 2030. The report said this would have significant implications for health services and demand across all health and social care sectors will increase substantially every year up to 2030. The report notes that between 1996 and 2016, Ireland's population bucked the trend elsewhere in the EU, growing by 31% as opposed to just 6% across the union. So this 1 million figure, this uh, added population between 2050 and 2030, as I've spoken about before and, and demonstrated and evidenced, is almost entirely from inward non-Irish migration, right? So again, it's not me saying it. The ESRI are pointing out that the key issue for the healthcare service will be this extra million people, which is entirely from mass immigration, right? Hence my argument in the first place. And, uh, you know, like this point at the bottom here as well is that our population, you know, grew 31% compared to 6% uh, in the rest of the European Union on on average. Um, clearly, this is a distinguishing factor of the Irish state and the Irish nation. Um, and it's particularly acute in our healthcare service, right? Because everybody needs a doctor. And in terms of staff as well, we have huge immigration rates into our healthcare service. So again, even if you're not with me so far, you must agree that this is a distinctive factor of our healthcare system and completely worth looking at. And, uh, you know, it is definitely a suspect. You just bear with me on that much so far, right? Um, so Dr. Rita Doyle, president of the Medical Council and a GP. So the Irish Medical Council is a, is a really professional uh, body, actually. It's one of the key um, representatives of uh, medical professionals in Ireland and receives no government funding, interestingly, which is great. Um, but here's the interesting point from Dr. Rita Doyle. She says, the big picture is that Ireland trains more doctors than any other country in the OECD, but we also export more doctors than any other country in the OECD. Now, that's crucial as when we're talking about this because someone could contend that, well, we just don't have the people. We don't have the, we don't have the talent. We don't have the skills. We don't have the education to create enough doctors to serve our 5 million population. Well, of course we do. We train, as she notes here, you know, uh, some of the best in the world. People, you know, her counterparts in New Zealand tell her that they love Irish doctors because they're some of the best in the world. We have some of the best in the world. You know, we're bringing those up and nurturing those um, people and with some of the best work ethic in the world as well, which has been noted. Um, so just... That's important because we do have the talent. It's a matter of not holding on to them and why the system is so bad and worsens to the point where it holds on to less and less of them. Now, I contend that, you know, um, mass 
immigration isn't a consequence of mass emigration, right? So think about this. I, I, I believe it's the contrary. I think mass emigration of our own is a consequence of mass immigration. The two are inextricably linked and there's an interplay, but definitely one of the large reasons why ours end up leaving is because so many are coming in and those people are coming from developing countries. So like I said at the start, there's going to be a, a, a willingness from people in developing countries to tolerate conditions that Irish people demonstrably will not tolerate because they leave, right? So it's almost axiomatic that ours leave in such huge numbers and people from developing countries come. Again, people don't emigrate and immigrate whims, uh, you know, at a whimsy. It's uh, they react to economic stimuli and it's pretty much as simple as that. Now, she goes on to say, um, there are not enough doctors in our system at any level, nor are there enough nurses. And again, remember, we train plenty, right? And some of the best in the world, nor are there enough nurses and that you may find that the doctors coming in don't have the same experience as the ones we are exporting. But that is an issue for the HSC, which is the employer. Think about that. Now, um, moving on to in the same uh, in the same vein um justice peter kelly president of the high court uh, in speaking about the healthcare system says our health service is not a crisis waiting to happen it is a crisis it's the worst i've known in 35 years now that 35 years if you measure it back is pretty much starting in 1984 shall we say or roughly that period now what big change what major phenom- phenomenon has occurred in the irish health service in the last 35 years well it's clearly in around the turn of the century this mass importation of foreign labor in the healthcare system you know so again if you're not with me totally on this stuff or you you know you feel a bit funny about it again it's a chief suspect just go with me on that much so far now let's move into some harder numbers here so our share of foreign trained nurses or foreign nurses um or the share of foreign trained nurses in OECD countries. Now, this is from 2008. I couldn't get any more recent data. If you find it, brilliant. But I think it should hold true for now. It probably reduced after the recession and picked back up again, you know, by now, uh, definitely, if not higher. That's my contention anyway. But so 47.1 in 2008 of our nurses were foreign or foreign trained. And if you, you know, this isn't a force of nature because look at our Western counterparts. Even they have 16, 22, 8%, 3%, 1%. So again, like I say, chief suspect, what is the big distinguishing factor of the Irish healthcare service compared to our Western counterparts? It is um, it is this massive turnover and replacement of staff, this kind of uh, substitution and switcheroo of our personnel with uh, personnel and staff from developing countries. So... Compare that, 47.1% foreign nurses, basically, as compared to this from recently, which is 70% of new nurses may emigrate. This is a report from the Irish Examiner last year. The crisis of our nurse recruitment and retention plaguing the service health service shows no sign of abating with 7 in 10 of the current co- crop of grads uh, considering emigration. In addition, the majority of cases of 2018, or yeah, the majority of the class of 2018, excuse me, 57% have already been approached by the overseas uh, recruitment companies. So again, you know, they're they're highly sought after, some of the best in the world. Uh, they're valued, but just not by us. Um, and, you know, I think we know why. And I'll demonstrate that as we go forward a bit more, hopefully. Now, just 18% were offered permanent contracts by the HSE. That's crazy, because think think about that. So 18% are offered contracts, you know, you would imagine, oh, well, maybe we have some kind of, uh, we don't, you know, we don't need that staff or something. So we offered, no, we, because 47% of them are foreign. So we clearly are taking people on. We're just not taking Irish people on. We're not offering them contracts. It's, that's a finer detail. Maybe there's something to that, but it just strikes me as very odd that. Now, this is from the journal and that's actually a fa- fantastic piece of journalism. I think Orla Ryan. Um, as doctors continue to emigrate, Ireland is becoming more reliant on foreign trained staff. So Ireland's incre- I'm just going to read this out because it's very interesting. Um, Ireland's increasing need for doctors is mainly being met by 
employing foreign trained doctors, according to a new report from the RCSI. Research carried out by the RCSI found that approximately 700 doctors graduate from six medical schools in Ireland each year. However, the percentage of Irish doctors on the Medical Council Register continues to fall. Now, pay attention to this, right? This is very interesting. While the number of new entrants to the register doubled between 2012 and 2015, the numbers of graduates from outside of Ireland who joined the register accounted for two-thirds of all new registrants in 2015. Africa contributed the highest number of doctors in this regard with 28%, and Pakistan supplies more than 20% of Ireland's foreign-trained doctors. The report states that the systematic drivers of this trend include high rates of emigration, right, um, the European Working Time Directive, I'm not going to speak on that, I don't, I don't know about that too much, and then increasing demand. So, you know, increasing demand comes from uh, mass immigration, and that's not an argument, that's just a fact. Um, and then we match that with foreign doctors and nurses when ours leave and the uh, the system is in a shambles the wages are too low and the conditions are too shitty basically to use uh, blunt language uh, uh, forgive me for that but um you know it's quite obvious here what's happening like i say this uh, this importation of of staff from developing countries stagnates wages and working conditions because it's completely natural that people from that part of the world are going to be you know more prone to accept those conditions at least to start out with than irish nurses right and uh you know we'll look at brain drain as well because it's not it's not good for these uh, countries that we import these doctors from either it really is not good it's one of the worst things you can imagine actually um because the same article goes on to talk about it. Professor Rory, uh, Rory Brewer, um, RCSI's head of uh, epidemiology and public health, said, we need high-level recognition of the scale of the problem and we need radical responses given the time and type of hospitals needed to train hospital specialists. So this bit is interesting. Currently, Irish hospitals are employing increasing numbers of foreign-trained doctors into posts that don't provide these doctors with an adequate level of supervised training. This is not good for patients, or for these doctors' careers. Um, and then he goes on to talk about this phenomenon of brain gain, brain waste, and brain drain. So even, to sum it up, basically, even the foreign doctors who come in from developing countries, you know, so an African doctor who comes in here, he's obviously coming from a, si a system which is even worse than the Irish system, a lot worse, right? As bad as ours is, that, this is going to be a lot worse. And even they, when they come here for a year or two, they basically you know um they stagnate and they 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 don't like it the conditions they pay everything else mainly the conditions that's the that's the big factor which is obviously a consequence of poor management even they can sometimes up sticks and leave so it's this kind of massive turnover beginning you know most egregiously with irish people having to leave but then it just demonstrates that even the foreigners kind of often leave um and you know what analogy this reminds me of is if you go to a restaurant, it kind of applies to any company, but let's take a restaurant, right? If you go to a restaurant and the same staff are there five years later, you know, what does it tell you about that um, that restaurant? It tells you it's a good place to work. They look after their staff. It's, uh, you know, if it's a nice place to work and they look after their staff, that's quite a holistic and an organic situation and positive situation. And you, you know what that implies. It probably implies that it's a good restaurant too. Um, to be a customer in so if we take the analogy it means a good system to be a patient in too right but ours is not like that ours is like the restaurant where you go in there every week and there's a new barista and a new sandwich maker and a new waiter because it's clearly a horrible place to work they look demoralized and the gum bean at the top just makes his money and just kind of burns his staff out on a regular basis and then they leave but he doesn't care he can always just get more in right and just like any company or any restaurant the only bargaining chip that would matter to the staff is to say you can't replace us you can't replace us you can't get anyone else like us and you just can't get in there aren't that many people around right so you need us therefore we want our full lunch break we want our you know uh, not to be called in at the weekend we want uh, a pay rise we want this stuff and if and we're not just asking for it out of the goodness of your heart we want it or we're leaving and you know 
the, the key thing there is that whether leaving will be detrimental or disastrous to this Gombean manager, prick guy, or lazy guy or whatever, will it be detrimental or disastrous to him or will it be a situation where he can just replace you? And if the person who doesn't like it or the person who he replaces you with doesn't like it either, he can replace them a week later too. And there'll always be someone willing to do it. If you don't have a border or a circle or something drawn around this labor pool, then you're not going to be able to bargain. And uh, that's something we'll get onto as well. But just in terms of uh, brain brain drain and brain gain and brain waste and stuff, uh, I just want to give him his dues here. He uh, he he says this firstly involves brain gain, Jesus, brain gain through the development of non-EU trained foreign doctors. The brain waste through slow or stagnant career progression for these individuals, leading to de-skilling, and finally brain drain through the uh, onward migration of these doctors. So, what we're dealing with here is this conveyor belt um, of a system, and it's not good. The conditions are awful, and it's so like there are a lot of. Uh, testimonies to this from irish nurses and doctors how and i've i've had some people tell me this directly doctors and nurses that it's so demoralizing that they can't even look after their patients adequately i've had some tell me that i i asked them okay it must be about pay how much do you really want and they go i just want to be able to look after my patients adequately you know and i can't um and i'm stressed out of my head and all of this that's not good and again it's this awful system relies on this mass immigration it just does and the best thing to do is cut off that route for them and that will produce positive change uh 100 so just okay just stick with this brain drain thing of developing countries just for those who would call it racist or something like that to um you know to have an issue with this stuff um physicians per thousand people ireland has three it's actually 3.1 this is from the world bank it's 3.1 just to note i got i wrote that down wrong and pakistan is one so you know if it's racist to be against mass immigration uh, in terms of our healthcare system there could be nothing more racist than depriving a developing country um or a country like pakistan of its medical personnel what could be more racist than that it's you know that's the worst thing imaginable right um now in terms of brain drain as well just to i don't mean to dwell on that too much but um, the U.S. National Library of Medicine wrote about this, an extensive article about brain drain. And they said the answer to this question um, is that even if you adjust the push factors, so that's the developing countries not being good and people leaving them, it may be outside one's domain to adjust the pull factors. Now, that strikes me as odd. It, you know, they say that as if it's an axiom, but it's, it's not. Because I take the example of Japan. Now, it's linked at the bottom. You can look it up in the description. The WHO report on Japan's healthcare system, which is ranked number nine um, compared to Ireland's 19. Uh, Japan's famous for having very low immigration rates, right? And yet their system is excellent. And they're in a demographic death spiral. So when they talk about, uh, you know, we have a high age dependency ratio. So therefore, as a just, you know, a... A force of nature we have to have mass immigration from the developing world no japan don't have that going on and um, they they acknowledge their problems and they have some of their own problems but their health system just operates differently to ours it's designed differently so it's a, and and it works a lot better and they they have addressed ways in which they'll uh or acknowledged ways in which they'll address the age dependency ratio thing um and there's you know when you have a problem there's a million different ways you could look at fixing it, improving, innovating, before you just say, let's just open the gates and just, you know, convey our belt our workers from the developing world and have our own flea. Um, there's so many other ways you can address it. And Japan do that. Um, and like I say, they're number nine. And in this report, the WHO report from Japan, you know, when they talk about the problems, like I say, at no point do they just go, oh, we have a age dependency ratio therefore we must do this no they innovate they think about it they improve their system um and that's all it takes you know um now there was something there was something i missed here and i have to go back so sorry i'm not too organized on this one here it's gonna be yes okay so this is a crucial point it was in this examiner article um the survey results so this was about that survey about um, Irish nurses leaving and not being offered places. 
The survey results bolster the union's claim, this is the INMO, that the government needs to urgently address the pay and working conditions of the INMO's 40,000 members, nurses and midwives. Now, think about that. Um, the union claim that the government needs to urgently address the pay and working conditions of the INMO. Hmm. Do they? I mean, do they? Think about that. Do the government need to urgently address the pay and working conditions? I know they should, and I know that would be the moral thing for them to do. But when was the last time the government was necessarily moral or doing things because they just really want to help us out? They, they only react to pressure. Pressure is not really going to come democratically. Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, uni party, right? Um, no time soon anyway. But they don't need to do that, nor does the HSE. Why would they need to increase pay and working conditions? Because all they, because nurses and midwives can just either quit and do something else with themselves, or they can emigrate to you know greener pastures. And that's the way the HSE and the state will look at it. Because they go, we have an endless supply of willing participants from Bangladesh, from Africa, from Pakistan, as we see. There is no pressure on them to do this. So just, you know, I know what the INMO are getting at there when they say they need to address it. But to think about that, they actually don't. They don't need to address that, which, you know, tells us that the INMO and the Irish... Um, um, what are they called? The Irish Medical uh, Union. It's, oh God, I've forgotten. Um, the Medical Council, the Irish Medical Council. So Dr. Rita Doyle. Um, you know, they need to speak about this because I know they're wrapped up in political correctness. The INMO had a huge protest uh, a couple of months back and I didn't once hear this acknowledged. It will be acknowledged in policy papers, just like I've shown you here, but they don't make it a campaigning issue. They're, because they're wrapped up in this, they're held hostage by NGOs and the media and all of this stuff with the racism and all this stuff. Um, they have to be straightforward about this. They don't need to be demagogues, but just they have to be straightforward because like a union, you know, unions until recently were keenly aware that mass immigration was, you know, a direct threat to workers. And they can pretend all they want now because they're under pressure and some of them are ideologically captured too. But there's no getting around that. That is really basic, straightforward fact. Um, the only way you can improve standards for your workers against your employers, because it is an adversarial relationship in a way, based on supply and demand, the only way to do that is to limit immigration. Like I said at the start, it's a, it's a necessary prerequisite to any positive change. And until they do that, the INMO and, uh, and uh, you know, Dr. Rita Doyle in the Medical Council and the INMO are pissing into the wind because the government, you know, don't need to urgently address anything under the current situation. And that is just the fact of the matter. Um, and that's basically all the point I wanted to make. And let's finish looking at this. Give us a reason to come home. Now, this struck me because, you know, again, why do they need to give these guys a reason to come home? Give us a reason to come home because you're nice people, because you're sound? No, that's never going to happen. We're all big boys and big girls, okay? We have to just be frank about this and not be afraid to say mass immigration, not because of immigrants or not whatever, just because of economic dynamics. This has to stop. Not end. You can't end it fully. You know, you'll always need some amount but like a serious moratorium and restriction on this. And then you will see, just like that restaurant or that company who has to, you know, improve the situation a bit, pay a bit more where they can, you know, offer a better work day where they can and better environment to work in where they can. And sure enough, they will. They will. The idea that if you cut off migration into here, inward migration on a mass scale, that it would just fold in on itself. No, it wouldn't. The, 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 you know, the system would have to, it would have to, the HSE would have to pull up its socks and the Irish state would have to pull their socks up. And, you know, we have the talent and we have the capital in this country too. Like, and like I say, they have to, pu they would have to pull their socks up. And I don't accept any other argument on this. Like, you know, that it's just not possible or something. They have to pull their socks up and their socks are completely pull upable. 
it, it you know it can happen easily but they won't do it and will never do it under the current situation where we have half our nurses are foreign and more and more every day while ours just hemorrhage from the country it doesn't need to be like this it does not need to be like this you need to stand up to your gambian you know leadership and demand that some territory on this you just do as a, from a labor perspective it's just essential so uh i'm gonna go back to my camera now and say goodbye because i rambled long enough uh so you know no major conclusion here um just uh the usual like share and subscribe definitely give me the old sub there and uh i've set up a bit shoot account as well and uh moved videos over to that just in case i get banned or any of that so um so you know if you're partial to it um go on to bit shoot i'll leave a link and uh and sign up because um there's a lot of good content there as well some people who are banned are over there so it, it's it's almost i was i was just perusing it today and uh all of the really some of the really interesting content creators are there some people i'd even forgot about so um definitely well worth subscribing to that and like i say give us a sub and a like and a share here if you if you enjoy the video and uh thanks for watching and take it easy see ya